consent. Yes. Well, better. Good afternoon, everybody. So I'm Alton Alexander, and it's my privilege to talk to you tonight. Um, I think this will probably turn into a little bit of a discussion with people that are here um, in person as well as online. Um, but before I dive into this, let me just give a little bit of background. So um, I am a data scientist. For about 10 years, I ran a consulting company in Salt Lake City. And um, in fact, one of my very first hires, my W-2 hires, was from a meetup like this. Mm. After he did his introductions, I just beelined right over to him and I was like, it's, <laughs> it's happening. And uh, that worked out. Um, several hires later, and uh, that, that was a fun little run. Uh, the last, let's see, like 18 months or so, I've been kind of playing low key and uh, took a bit of a gap and then started a startup. Um, and I was trolling the internet, found what Pat was doing, <laughs> I got reconnected last night and happened to have a presentation in my back pocket that I'm taking to um, content marketing world. So the audience is a little bit more, we'll talk about that in a second, a little bit more creative potentially. Um, but there's a separate track for data science and analytics and that's uh, where this is focused. So um, let's see, what else do I wanna cover? Um, if they wanna ask questions or anything, feel free to either unmute and ask yeah. questions or they can put it in the chat and I'll see it too as well. Yeah, and uh, I literally put together this presentation yesterday <laughs> because it was due last night <laughs> for, the, for the conference next week. Hopefully they don't catch wind of that, but uh, <laughs> so sorry for being guinea pigs. Um, but really, this is this is for your benefit. So any questions you have, I'm excited to cover it. Um, so without further ado, accelerate your marketing, your, your content marketing efforts. So the idea is, especially in today's day and age, if you're in a space where you're working with marketing teams, you might find yourself getting pulled into the content discussion, right? Especially with like. John Fackrell mentioned the large language models and some of the auto generation that can be done around video and images. It's just exciting to leverage the types of skills that we have in, you know, in programming in Python and so forth into this exciting space of how to kind of position a brand um, and generate this content. From a content marketer's perspective, certainly they're overwhelmed with not only the influx of new tools, but just keeping up with, um, being top of mind and being uh, a relevant voice to their own audience, right? So what does that mean? For us, it means introducing integration and automation as a solution for creating content better, faster, and more efficiently. So um, that's where Python comes in. Now, like I said at the beginning, the, the audience that I'm gonna be talking to is still a little bit unknown. I'll find out here in a few days when I fly out to DC. But um, certainly you could relate to uh, on this kind of, um, you know, in this uh, spectrum of creative or analytical. Um, so for example, if you're brand new to Python, but maybe you're a little bit tech savvy, you might relate with being a tech savvy AI explorer. Uh, likewise, if you're more of a creative individual, you might relate with being an AI visionary and somebody who's excited to embrace these new tools. The point of this conversation today and this presentation is to show you a handful of examples that, um, that it's 100% accessible and relatable and, and you can do this. Um, so you might come with some misconceptions or some barriers feeling like um, AI is too complex or Python is um, maybe too slow, you know, it's, it's impractical, but uh, I definitely want to tell you that these are powerful tools. So, so where do you start? Um, I think that you, uh, wait, I didn't catch your name. Brandon. Brandon, yeah, you're the only one I didn't catch. Brandon, so uh, you, you said that you're just starting with Python and SQL. What's your go-to resource or what are you doing to jump in with two feet? Um, I've, Went on to, uh, I never know if I'm pronouncing it right, Udemy. You, you, oh, sure. You, <laughs> that place. 
um, and, and did a couple of basic ones there with like the monthly thing. And then sure. I'm trying to do as much as that as I can just to get the basics done and then, and then YouTube. Okay. Way. So today, or, or for, I guess the last six months with the evolution of these large language models, what I'm seeing is a lot of those creative individuals that want to jump in and kind of embrace, you know, these exciting capabilities are just going right to like chat GPT and they are basically just asking for prompts. And now with, you know, um, uh, you know, the, the script, um, generators, you can basically have it write Python for you. Um, but what I'm encouraging people to do is to get away from the chat interface and start to really leverage, um, a programming environment and the best kind of leap into that space, I think is still continues to be Python notebooks where a Python notebook is basically for these cells where you can write documentation and code and you can run it kind of iteratively, but it makes it really nice to document and to make it repetitive, um, uh, repeatable and ensures consistency and accuracy. And above all, it makes it really easy to share with other people. So like I promised, uh, the rest of this talk, I'm going to show five examples of practical use cases in this marketing, you know, content generation and analytics space. And all of them include Python notebooks. So, um, and since we have a little bit more time today than I will when I'm doing my actual presentation on stage, well, next week I have a presentation and I have a workshop. So this is kind of like the lead into the workshop, but um, we're gonna probably dive into some of the notebooks and, and you'll all get a copy of it if you want. So the first one is competitive analysis. Um, as an analyst, this is an activity that you often find yourself doing, which is basically looking at um, and crossing any type of internal data that you have with any publicly available information that you have on competitors. And for this audience, uh, um, the example that I'm showing is uh, using Google search. Um, in fact, there are dozens of SaaS and companies that live off of basically scraping Google or any other marketplace, you know, Airbnb, um, eBay, in, you know, anywhere there's a marketplace, collecting all that information and basically building data sets um, and tools that you can easily, you know, digest that information for the, you know, average user. And what I'm encouraging is that now you can do this yourself. And one of these tools that makes it super easy is called SERP API. Uh, it's literally like five lines of code to basically, or last one line to, um, to scrape Google and start to collect that information. And it literally looks like this, uh, like I promise, I'm going to share on the next slide, this exact Python notebook, but basically you can use standard libraries and as well as that one for that company that I just showed, put in your API key, and then you can start to collect information. Like right here, I'm doing the query on Python for SEO, um, and then you can collect the top 10 results. And then I'm just showing, you know, a handful of those first ones, which from here, and you'll see in the document, uh, in, in the Google, you know, in the notebook that you can, um, you know, perform any type of analysis you like to do. In fact, I have one client that um, I'm actively collecting more than 200,000 keywords every, um, every month and monitoring those for them. Um, in my SaaS tool. And that's just one client. So um, cool. So that's competitive analysis. And like I said, uh, this link actually doesn't work. So don't even try it right now. <laughs> I just haven't finished it. Um, like I said, it was late night. Uh, but I will still share it. Uh, so to summarize competitive analysis, in this example, you can basically collect information off the internet by scraping or, um, or using APIs and ideally stay ahead of the game by understanding your competitors and, um, and optimizing against their strategies. So what can you do next? And this is uh, part of what's super exciting the last, I don't know, uh, two years has been the accessibility of large language models publicly and, uh, and especially kind of their accuracy, I guess you could say, I use that kind of loosely, but um, it, it grammatically convincing. Um, and, uh, but generative AI via API is super powerful. And if you haven't yet, um, you, you know, 
if you're using you chat GPT, then I encourage you to dive in and explore some more as a developer and programmer. Um, explore the playground and this makes it super easy to jump in and start to use, uh, embed this in your processes by uh, just viewing the code and taking your prompts right into it. So, uh, so what does this look like from a practical sense? Generative AI is, is um, certainly taking the internet by storm and making maybe creative marketers jobs harder because there's a lot more noise, right? But it also um, introduces a technical component to the problem, right? So that you can do it at scale and, and incorporate um, a new kind of creative process. So, um, so that's number two. That might be the one that we dive into. I don't know, actually, I'll let you guys decide. Uh, so number three, um, another one that's really exciting is, again, kind of using the language models um, in another way, but more on the research side, is to um, allow it to help you in your creative process, right? And one example is for um, defining who your audience is. And you can create, I mean, you can certainly just ask, you know, um, create prompts that, you know, ask who are ideal customers of such and such. Like right here, I just gave five examples of uh, give me the buyer personas for uh, domestic travel destinations. But what's more exciting is incorporating something like your competitors' product reviews, turning those product reviews into what are some of the top complaints, create those complaints into what are the features, and then how can I write about those features or present those features um, you know, via text or image or video in a way that resonates the most with these different audiences. And incorporating this into your creative process um, makes it so that you can do it more quickly and efficiently, but I certainly encourage still keeping human in the loop, right? It's just speeding it up. Um, in fact, this is something that I've been doing and experimenting with for the last six months. I jumped on Twitter about the same time that Elon Musk bought it because I was just curious and never had really gotten into Twitter and kind of found my groove. And within six months and using some of the um, things that I've described here, I have now 6,000 followers, which is pretty fun to engage and talk, even though sometimes they don't know they're talking to you know, my programs, <laughs> but uh, that's okay. Um, Persona development and voice of the customer. So uh, in recap, you know, this is automating that um, creative analysis and using Python and AI, um, you know, to really tailor your content or to identify new things that would resonate with your audience's needs and preferences. And that's one of the notebooks we'll talk about. Okay, so the fourth example is clustering. And um, clustering is a, is a super powerful data science process that uh, you need to incorporate in your tool belt if you haven't yet. The idea is basically how do you take um, a large sample of totally disparate or you know, seemingly uh, related but unorganized information and assimilate it into something that has some hierarchy. And um, again, you know, with the power of large language models, given a small enough data set, you could simply ask it, you know, as long as it fits in the context. Wait, so this is closer to the LLM, not a K-means or something? And it's not K-means actually. This, this one example that I, that I have in the next notebook is, oh man, maybe we should go dive into this one. This one's, uh, this one's basically set theory. The idea is, let's say that I am in the space of these, um, uh, what are these ceiling fans? And certainly there are ceiling fans that could be described using lots of different language or, or you know, titles and keywords, um, you know, for indoor ceiling fans with lights, with LEDs, you know, fans with, um, with remotes, outdoor lights, right? Um, imagine just a giant list of keywords. The idea here is um, this particular tool first groups them based on their co-occurrence 
on a platform like Amazon or um, Google. Yeah, exactly. And then once you find all the co-occurrences, meaning like if I search for um, ceiling fan with lights, actually here, we can just use this example right here, ceiling fan LED and indoor ceiling fan or indoor ceiling fan with lights, um, searching for these would certainly yield a list of results, right? But if a certain number of those overlap, the results overlap, then but they don't overlap with these other ones like 52 inch ceiling fans, then that means that they should be grouped together. Uh, so this tool basically can handle, like I said, I have one client that's doing like 200,000 plus keywords and, uh, and that helps them to first group and monitor, um, you know, first group them because then you can do more powerful analytics as a set instead of one at a time. It also certainly helps with your content generation right? Because you don't want to have one Amazon listing for every single variation of the keyword. You want to just target that one kind of intent. Um, so clustering certainly comes into play in several places. And one of them obviously is recommendations and, uh, you know, and, and providing just one content piece um, for, for each group. So, uh, so, so that's certainly where Python and AI comes into play for clustering and for content recommendation. You can, this will certainly help you optimize your content for search engines and provide personalized recommendations. Yeah, maybe this is a powerful one we could dive into. It's a little bit more intense, but so building on this, what's powerful is, and as a data scientist, you want to look at forecasts and trends, you know, leveraging a lot of the uh, standard machine learning tools, but using powerful data sets, <clears throat> that you can create, gather, or, you know, group. Um, certainly then you want to look at topics and forecasts. Uh, this is just obviously Google Trends, um, which I took a screenshot of last night, which happened to be National Cheeseburger Day. It's a great thing to celebrate. Yeah, it was, except, and then I was inspired to go out and get a burger and I got sucked in by my kids to, <laughs> Okay, maybe it wasn't entirely them. I mean, I was driving, but uh, yeah. gosh, we went to Burger King and it was, oh, wow. Man. It was like the first time in 10 years I've went to Burger King. Yeah, that was, yeah. That was a bad choice on that one. I was like, wow, yeah. yeah, we've had way better burgers. Yeah. yeah. But whatever. That is, so, so following trends, uh, you know, using tools to identify trends, but then also using, um, you know, standard analytics to uh, forecast and incorporate that into your your um, content creation is super powerful and a valid use case for Python and AI today. So, so all this combined, you know, you can stay ahead of the curve. Um, and like I said, these, I have all these sheets. We're going to take a few minutes and dive into it. But before we do, um, ultimately, I just want to reiterate that by no means is this comprehensive. There's lots of things you can do with Python and AI. I just want to inspire you that it's absolutely doable. And the patterns are um, some of the ones that we already know as analysts and data scientists, um, regardless of where you're coming from, you know, exploring the data and, and looking at kind of what you have, looking at the distributions and, um, you know, missing uh, data points. It also includes predicting and forecasting, whether that's over time or, you know, by group. Um, and then, of course, the classification and clustering example, like I said, but what's becoming more and more relevant and powerful is um, becoming versed with prompt engineering and understanding how to how that fits in in your flow. Um, and in this case, I'll admit actually real quick that um, this particular use case is a lot easier because a lot of the tools are publicly accessible. And I actually saw last night that you have a talk that you're that you threw up that is potentially using language models kind of behind the scenes. And that's one of the cool things that I'm actually doing with a client that I just picked up and, and I'm working with for the Air Force and Navy, where obviously they're not going to tap into some public API, right? But they, they see the tools and we want to introduce that into a learning environment where they're, you know, restricted by resources. Um, everybody has time limitations, especially the instructors. And, um, and you know, how to just make that a more seamless process um, 
And so certainly these patterns apply, not just for marketing, but for every field. So uh, regardless, look for ways to incorporate best practices. And like I said, um, you know, Python notebooks are a great way to go. The one that I'm gonna probably show you will just be writing Google Collab, which makes it like dead easy to share. I mean, you can hit run. You'll probably all be able to run it right now if you want it. Um, and then, uh, I mean, that's my goal with the workshop that I'm gonna do next week. Um, but, you know, uh, adopting these, these Python tools and libraries and uh, obviously continuing to test, collaborate. And, and if you are gonna use AI, you know, make sure you've got human in the loop so that you're not caught um, making any mistakes and consider the ethical um, implications of what you're doing, right? Know your data sources as always, um, uh, you know, cite them properly. If, you know, again, if you're auto-generating something, you need to think about how you do that. Um, and then uh, of course you wanna measure it for success. And so be sure to tag it. And if you're distributing this content or using this information to guide or even to automate some of your organic or paid, you know, content, then certainly tag that so you can monitor the performance and compare it against, um, you know, other channels. I really like that you bring that one up because um, it shows more and more with all this AI generated content we're getting, we're getting more and more of it where it's like, you know, that was AI because nobody read it beforehand. Oh yeah. Like so it went out so and it's like, see. it's just so off the charts and that. And so I really like that, that you're bringing yes. that up because I think as we move more and more into this, we're going to see it even more. And you know that somebody didn't check it or look at it or read it. And so, yeah. There's a lawyer that uh, he just gave facts out like they were facts. They came from uh, oh, yeah. ChatGPT. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, you just really heard about that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. You did have one question, just what was the name of your startup? This was one of the questions that was asked. Yeah, let's put down that rabbit hole because I realized I, I breezed through these. Um, what time did we start, by the way? Uh, 640. 6.40. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Are so, you still doing with front analytics? Yeah, so I have, I have front analytics, which is my consulting arm, I guess. My startup is called Content Curator. And um, I have about two dozen subscribers. Well, I have about a dozen paid subscribers and then I have a pay as you go plan and I get a few every day. Um, I could frankly be better with my own analytics, but it's, I'm just rolling it out as fast as I can. Um, some of the features that I just described are available off the shelf, like right here for keyword clustering, you can just copy and paste in your keywords and it will do the clustering just like I described. Um, and, uh, and, uh, so this has been a lot of fun. In fact, this entire piece as a side note, this entire startup, I think this will probably be, if I do a talk, this might be what I submit because this, this whole thing is, um, I mean, it auto scales, it's all on GCP, um, highly integrated with Vertex AI and OpenAI and, uh, and a few other proprietary things, but, but uh, yeah, there's a lot involved, you know, going end to end building a SaaS startup. And that would be fun to talk about. Lessons learned maybe. Uh, okay, so, so that's, that's one piece. While I was doing that, like I said, I, I have been writing a ton and some of my best success on Twitter has been um, just sharing a ton of information, a ton of content. And um, so I probably give away way more than most people <clears throat> and that earns a lot of likes and a lot of follows like this. I actually have my monthly recurring revenue. <laughs> I, I was excited that day. Um, whatever. So who cares? I just share and have a lot of fun. And all my code is up and available. In fact, uh, so this is the next piece, but maybe before I dive into that, um, well, here, let me just show you. So, so one of the things I started with was, you know, I got everybody all excited about a bunch of these 
uh, free posts, but I realized that I, a lot of people just had a ton more questions than I could answer. Uh, I gave away all the code for free. Uh, a lot of it was, you know, assisted by ChatGPT. Um, so there's like the personas and everything. Um, uh, yeah, there's, I don't know, there's a ton of them here. Generative text, I don't know, what did this get 500 likes or whatever. Um, there's the SERP API one. Anyways, all this I wrapped up into a course. Um, and if anybody listening wants access, just hit me up and I'll let you in. Uh, let's see, but so where that leads me is I still have all the code for free. And th these are the notebooks that we've been talking about. So before we dive into kind of a hands-on, maybe we'll do like just a few minutes of discussion and, and uh, questions, uh, ask me anything or each other or whatever. And then, and then we'll settle on which one of these notebooks you want to see or two, but let me just go in the network. Um, so what questions do you have about, I kind of breezed through my, my talk, but anything in particular about the use case or my background or for the people who don't do use it, what kind of results do they get? Oh, yeah, great questions. Great question. So, um, so are, are you talking about my app or my, or my, like my tools? These, uh, oh, the your app. oh sure. Yeah. yeah. So, my, the audience for this, oh, okay, there's a little bit more of a backstory. Uh, after like 18 months ago or two years ago, I was looking for maybe a different business model than consulting uh, after having run that for a while and a little bit burnt out. <laughs> and that was just like six months before COVID. So I was doing a lot of Bitcoin and I was looking at maybe writing some books or kind of, you know, going to different avenues. But then I settled on um, creating niche websites, which are basically super hyper focused i share one of them on twitter because i'm crazy like that it's tourism Ooh, this one's actually not finished this is just like tip of the iceberg but yeah i mean if you look closely you'll see the entire site is auto generated <laughs> uh this this is like one of i have 20 that are actually getting decent traffic um but i have like 80 little websites like this that i'm like targeting tons of very small you know topics so that's kind of how it started and then i realized i was just writing all these different python notebooks and and you know python scripts and that's when i got on twitter and started sharing them and then that's when i realized wow that a lot of people can use it and, and, you know, they're eager to kind of see, especially right before, you know, LLMs could basically write the whole notebook. <laughs> um, some of them are a little more complex than others, but, um, and then that's when I wrapped it up into the SaaS, right? And so, so long story short, the people that I'm targeting on this tool are people that have a content website and they're looking for ways to add more content to their site by targeting like really low hanging fruit, um, you know, topics that are highly related to what they're already writing about, what their audience already cares about. And so, um, so some of that starts with, um, some of that starts with like discovering a new topic, you know, so you can come in here and literally just go find a brand new topic to write about. Um, it also includes, uh, generating new lists of ideas, um, writing, you know, clustering those into distinct ideas. This is definitely a heavy use. And then lately I just barely bolted on this capability, which is, um, which is to automatically write a full article, right? I mean, there's dime a dozen, there's so many tools to do this, but figure I throw my hat in the ring. So, so some people use it for that too. Yeah. So auto-generating content. 
and our internet must be down or my site's down, which is not out of the realm of possibility, but I doubt it. No offense to the network. I mean, you got a great space here. And by the way, yeah, kudos to, to Deep Sea for hosting this. And again, huge shout out to uh, Pat for keeping us alive and for getting us all together tonight. I was going to say the network is still up because everybody on Zoom is still there. So, <laughs> so, uh, so question about... it's not the network. Yeah. Any other questions? Otherwise, I'll Do you just use um, the vanilla version of most Gen AI tools or using like Langchain or doing any fine tuning, such as like adjusting the attention layer or manipulating the output layer or manipulating the input? Yeah. Um, I definitely manipulate the inputs. All right. Um, but most of my my stuff is um, uh, I don't use Langchain. It, it just feels overly complex, um, hard to debug. I don't know. Maybe I got in too early and gave up on it. I don't know. And I've had quite the opposite with Langchain. Oh yeah, you're happy with it? Or the non AI yeah, people, the non AI people like me, who's just more lower level. Could you explain that? Like chain? Yeah. Oh, oh it's just, it chains together different language LLMs. Basically. Yeah, it's a two set to integrate with large language models so you can develop an agent. So an agent could be something that connects to Twitter. So you could have your model connect to Twitter or get data from one place. So it's just the glue oh. layer to interact. Plugins on ChatGPT4. So, so plugins live kind of on their website. This is more in your code. Yeah, okay. in your own. And then one thing I've used with Langchain is so you can plug in your choice of LLM. So and swap it, yeah. Yeah. So what I've been dealing with is people that have private documents that don't want to go on a open AI. Right. So you build an index of that, you keep that locally. And then you query not open AI, but a private a model that can you can run locally. So that way their data is protected completely. Gotcha. But that's made, you know, doable using lane chain. With yeah, it's, too much. it is dead simple using lane chain. But then when yeah. you want to do anything more advanced, you either have to dive into the internals of lane chain or just go your own. That's been my experience. Uh, let's see. So, but the vast majority of this tool, yeah, it's basically a wrapper for for AI or for uh, APIs. Yeah, which is. Exciting that you can build whole SaaS companies on the backs of other people's APIs. I think that's probably my biggest difference in, in sitting here for the last 10 years to think about this is that um, when we tried to do presentations or things in the past or um, the hackathons we did and everything like this, we had a ton of time to build things that did those models and all sorts of stuff. And now with OpenAI and ChatGPT and things like that, it's so much easier to get to those things and to move them faster. Yeah, I feel like it's enabled a lot of people, but Alton, you've probably seen this. Like, it also opens up a lot of pitfalls. Like, people that don't come from our background, they oh, don't yeah, know data cool. science. They just kind of get yeah. ahead of themselves. And yeah. that's why I was so happy to see the fact checking in there and the content. In other words, yeah, that's the problem. Is if you just jump in and you just do it, you're going to produce something that doesn't make any sense. You still need that human access to it. You still need to be able to think about it. It just makes it that much faster for those people that are. In I view all of these as not as you know the whole people are like, oh my god, AI is going to replace people. It's yeah. like no, but what it's going to do is what computers did for accountants back in the '80s. You know. It's, well, you're not going to do it in sheets of paper and how you're going to do it on a computer. And it's just making you a lot more efficient. Yes. And the same thing here is if you're writing content, learn to use the tools and then be able to create better content, create it faster. Yeah, yeah I agree. Yeah. But yeah, people that don't want to keep up with time will probably get run over. But oh, that's, yeah. that's on them. You know, Sam, you always like, Judge GPT is not going to replace you, but the person using it will. That, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes. And that's the point is that it, it's very, like I just used it recently to do help with an API and things like that and spit out code. It kept making mistakes over and over again, but I could read the code, I could figure it out, and then I could change it myself because I had the experience of what I needed. It just helped me along on doing that. That's where a lot of people really love GitHub's Copilot and things yeah. like that. Copilot's great, 
because they already know how to write the code, but it just makes everything faster. Especially if you're writing something like Java or Go that's very verbose, mm -hmm. you type in the comment, you write the class, and it just generates the whole thing. 80% of it's right. Yeah. Yeah. Fill in you gotta, yeah. Again, you got to check. You got to make sure. You yeah. Gotta, you does it compile? Does it logic, run? Yeah. But it at least sets you up where, you know, instead of three hours now, it takes you one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. How do you think that's going to affect like the junior dev? Um, like talent pool because it's basically a junior dev. Like it creates. No, I mean I feel like again, like I was saying, you know, it's not like you're going to replace junior devs. Junior devs always are going to have to be there just by the process mm -hmm. of growth. But now junior devs might be able to churn out more. They won't be stuck on silly compilers because they can just go ask ChatGPT yeah. or Copilot or whatever. With you know, hey, how do I get past this? I mean, I just. Did it last night. I was stuck on something. And yes. Just fixed with Copilot and VS Code. You know, it's like boom. Find that. Oh, that's yeah. the solution. So I didn't even have to leave my ID. Go to Google. You're still gonna have <laughs> you. You still don't have the experience. Is the problem with the junior dev or anybody else? They're still gonna write something <laughs> that it's like this is never gonna scale. This is exactly. never the scalability. Yeah. <laughs> this is never gonna do this stuff. It's gonna do what function they asked it yeah. to do, but they have no idea what happens when five million of them are running or something like that, or that experience of scale and all those other things. That's still gonna fail in the future. So, but yes, I think they're gonna produce more faster. I think they're gonna produce more of that. Sure, I. I honestly believe that AI is going to allow us to keep producing more quicker. I mean, just like smaller bones did and everything else, we've been producing more. It's just the next stage of producing. More. Yeah, I like what he said. You know, it's not the AI is going to replace people; it's the guys that use, use it. it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and maybe in the future there will be a class in college or whatever else for devs to learn how to use ChatGPT and stuff like that. Or there's going to naturally. Do it. I mean, that's just what they're going to. I mean, I feel like at this point, if you're not using um, Copilot in, yeah. in a dev environment, I don't know what you're doing. Like. <laughs> you just need to do it. Yeah. I've heard the same thing. Or you're many just of my, right? I've heard the same thing. From many of my There's so much devs. scaffolding. Well, yeah. not in Python, but yeah. And many and of the senior roster, devs I've talked to, they've all do the same thing. They use Copilot because it's just faster to help them write these things. It's Especially not, if you're writing, you know, like Python, I don't see too much, too much value because it's very succinct. Mm -hmm. But if you're writing Java or Rust or Go, yeah, where there's, a lot. there's so much boilerplate. Yeah. I haven't used Copilot, so I'm, I'm guessing you just kind of hit a shortcut and it automates all your boilerplate. Oh, dude, not even that. <laughs> it's even easier. You just write your comment. You just start writing and it starts. Uh, yeah, and it just, you know how it auto completes the met function names and stuff? Usually oh, okay. it's that, but it generates like whole classes. Oh, wow. Yeah, you got to check it out. If you haven't done it, you, it'll change the way you're doing things. I think Nate, one of my friends that's helped with the group and stuff in the past, um, I think he did a presentation on using it somewhere, maybe at the Northern Utah.net. Yeah, I, I would highly suggest what, what ID is or what language do you program? I'm a data analyst, so it's all Power BI. It's DAX, SQL. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I'm they'll still do it in there, though. So, ChatGPT will handle those as well. It'll do SQL. Oh yeah, SQL yeah. copy paste. Yeah, it'll yeah. do SQL a lot. Yeah. So you should you should definitely check it out. Um, just get the plugin for VS Code, like um, they were talking about, or you can. Um, I think if you install from GitHub, you can do it that way too. You know, I've had it like write this, do the transformation in Python. Now do it in SQL. Oh yeah, and yeah. it'll do the same thing like in two different <clears throat> languages, so you can uh, see how it goes. One thing I don't love to be like, I guess, the voice of dissent or whatever Absolutely. about uh, Gen AI and ChatGPT is that it very quickly hits bounds, um, especially in terms of like a great example, unit testing, absolutely shits itself when you try to get it to work with it really well and integrate it heavily. Um, zero shot or yeah, zero and one shot learning does very poorly. Yeah. Um, C++, interestingly enough, doesn't do you can't really get great code snippets uh it's, even for like problems that are well documented on like leak code or or similar websites which i thought was interesting uh but going back to like the sequel thing i've noticed that while it can write sequel it writes very poorly optimized sequel especially when you try to define which um which data warehouse or data data platform yeah. 
Postgressql um, or Oracle, one of those. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. BigQuery is, is a bad offender, um, I've noticed. And so, yeah. Okay, but let's be clear on this. ORM still haven't gotten that right after 30 years or 20 years. That's true. So, and AI is doing nothing more than what an ORM would do. That's the same thing. So the SQL is never going to be great that comes out of a generator like that. Yeah. You've got to get that experience of the pieces. Of it. And again, I live my world in SQL. So oh, I, I've, I've seen every bad ORM. Yeah. yeah. But well, I also feel like that was step by step, right? Like, what Alton's doing yeah. a lot of his stuff is probably not too optimized for traffic, but why bother today? Right, right. Just and go so, get the traffic. And and that's the point. In many cases, it's okay for your SQL to be not exactly. optimized yeah, right off the bat. Yeah, you know, in the beginning, it doesn't matter. Yeah. And then later on, as you move forward, you scale or you hire a DBA or something like that. You know, and that's where we come in. The pyramid, make, make it work, make it right, make it fast. Yes. Yeah, yeah exactly. So steps you go through. What's ORM? You mentioned ORM. Object mm -hmm. Relational Mapper. It's the oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. definition yeah. of the worst thing you can do to a database at scale. Um, <laughs> again, I'm a database person, <laughs> so I've lived my life as a DBA, and all I have to deal with is crappy ORM. When companies have money, they hire him. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> After the ORM goes for three or four years, then they bring in a DBA like me, and, they, and we all say, stop it right now. <laughs> Just... <laughs> Let's help you here, you know, take this out. So, but um, yeah. I guess, okay, not a question of descent. But um, when, is it hard to define metrics of success in these areas? Because it can be very soft um, for like marketing content oh, and like, soft. yeah. So how, <clears throat> what's the, I mean, for me, it's all about the money, right? Like, <laughs> I mean, I made these niche websites so that I can make money. And if I can, if I can produce even the lowest tier content, but it gets eyeballs and it, I mean, it sounds dirty, but it, it's kind of, <laughs> <laughs> well, but you're not, it's, it's modern it's, spam, frankly. It's, <clears throat> you're not far off though, too. I mean, every company's goal is, yeah, exactly, but we don't, we make no mistake that, you know, <laughs> they could be wonderful things, but they still have to make money. So that could be a measure. I would agree, though, that I would love to see other measures out there as well. Yeah. Too, besides that, but yeah, when it comes to content, I mean, unfortunately, it's all about you. <laughs> you figure out how to get people to navigate to your spam. <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, and a lot of it's just producing stuff where other people aren't competing yet. You know, just find the lowest hanging fruit. So it sounds like this kind of brings, so I'm not a good marketer. I've tried it before, I suck. Yeah. Uh, that would bring me maybe up to average, maybe at best. Yeah, good. Uh, I think that's kind of what AI does in general. It takes, if you're really sucky at a skill, it might bring you somewhere close to average. Yeah. But if you're really good at it, you're gonna look at that code or whatever it's writing. You'd be like, yeah, that kind of sucks. So. <clears throat> well, you gotta consider the training data set, right? Yeah. Like, where do they get the coding information off of GitHub, Stack Overflow? And like you were saying, C++, I don't know that many good C++ developers. Like most of the code, C++ code I've seen in my career has been pretty okay. Yeah. And LMs are just designed to statistically predict the next right thing, the next yeah. what would occur. Mm -hmm. And statistics are all averages. So what is the average thing I can produce? Uh, I, I, so. Kind of. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have an undergraduate in statistics and I did further coursework in like AI stuff. And I, I disagree with the sentiment that statistics is like the average, but so here you besmirch statistics <laughs> like that. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, it's a it's a passion. It's a mistress basically, because I'm a data engineer now and I'm jaded against the world of sure uh, stuff, but it's fine, whatever. <laughs> Yeah, we can see people botch statistics so much that it just, yeah, it feels sick. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. You can sometimes make numbers say whatever you want. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, you can do that. You can do that. So, um, man, I was just looking through some of my old stuff. Out of all these, any kind of passion or desire to see one example or the other? Um, yeah, pick up one of the scraping ones. I was actually curious. This seems like sure. it does the job of Amazon dropshippers, where they basically find where no one's competing. Oh, yeah. And then 
drop shipping is a huge example. Yeah, fulfilled by Amazon. Yeah, I mean that's that's very similar to the niche site. My mind's all content. I you know all my sites are. I'm not this one. They're all monetized with ads. Um, yeah, I'm not going to show any of my sites though. Besides this one, <laughs> I was just thinking about it. Uh, yeah, this is recorded. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of a weird space because people are pretty vocal about stuff that they're trying and doing mm -hmm. on Twitter, but they nobody really shares what site they're doing. Um, uh, but uh, let's see. Yeah, but exactly. Fulfilled by Amazon is very similar, right? You want to go find products that are hot and trending, um, position them on the you know search results so that they get in front of the you know buyers. <laughs> um you know that have high intent and then yeah yeah i mean fulfilled by amazon is a very interesting example right because you look at something like a daily product like dish soap and then you realize how many there are and like every week there's another company that sells dish soap that shows up but yeah there's something that's keeping these people still getting into that business i don't know what it is but god there's like so many different brands of dish soap. And yeah, they smell a little different, but at the end of the day, they're pretty much the same stuff. Yeah, I, I didn't spend a lot of time on this business model before I realized it wasn't for me. Um, but I'd say like two years ago, it felt like um, a lot of the smaller players were starting to get bought up by aggregators. Yeah. And, and I think that happened around the time that they started really leveraging brands on Amazon. And so building, I mean, pump and dumping a brand uh, started happening a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, once you had a, a, a reputable brand and it could be something just like totally off the wall, like this one, half price drapes store, like, okay, that doesn't tell me anything about their brand, but because of what they've built, right. I mean, they're probably doing extremely good millions. You know what I mean? It's it's a good business model. If that's your thing. So, yeah, that's a perfect use case. So let's see. Uh, yeah, I I don't have like a well. Actually, let me see what I have. So let me just be the first to admit that. Well, this this has been a lot of fun to create all these different ones. Let's see if there's one that's even worth kind of showing. Um, scrape top results for metadata summary. Okay, let's see what this one does. I think this one follows a pattern. Um, let's see if I even link to it. So one of the things I like about these is you can go to collab and, oops, and um, this is normally how I share them with non-technical people just literally give them a drop them a link to you see it points right to my github repo, yeah just all right that gets them right in here where they can see the documentation and then they can just start to hit run and just like a lot of other notebooks uh, you know notebook environments um just google cloud makes it easy to share and collaborate i frankly don't even know what I'm sure if you used it enough, they would want to push you onto a paid tier. But oh uh, yeah, yeah. But I never even got also it. like if you were trying to use GPUs. Oh yeah, I mean even then you can fire up. Uh, they're probably all spot instances, you know. It's Who's so the company that does GPUs as a Lambda style now. I'm sure there's dozens, but I'm pretty heavily invested in. GCP, just because I'm lazy. I, I yeah, GCP is definitely. <laughs> I, don't even, I don't even research anymore. I just <clears throat> my go-to. So, oh, this was the exact example I was saying. So here, for example, yeah, I hit run on this cell and installing the um, any libraries that I need that are not default in you know Python vanilla, uh, and then here I can load other libraries that are default or the ones that I've installed, and then once I have that, I can simply set this variable query, uh, you know, Python for SEO. And then like I was showing, this does the search, but it's using, uh, this example is using 
you will search Python, which must be one that doesn't require a API, but you see it literally just went out and ran a behind the scenes, it ran a Google search and completely abstracted thanks to this library that some you know gracious soul has put together. Um, abstracted what we would have normally done, you know, literally scraping the oh, yeah. HTML, right? Having to work with that's a lot of work. Yeah. And then of course with some a company like Google, you would need to rotate your proxy and kind of get through anything that would be keeping you from seeing the actual page. Uh, I just wanted to copy this and, and uh, let's see. So, so you can see here, um, if I'm in this space and I want to be kind of monitoring who these competitors are, I might be looking at who is currently ranking and where my content sits. And I might want to also pull down other information from each one of these. And, uh, and it starts by just first getting all those links. And then once I have all that information in this notebook, like I was alluding to, now I can do more advanced things. Like in this case, I, I have a function for parsing the sections to links. Uh, I mean, yeah, sure. I went through and, and wrote this. You literally could probably ask chat GPT now. And just, oh yeah. Actually, frankly, I'm kind of curious. Uh, and, and this is where some of my workflow starts. I'll just come in here and just be like um, Python code for parsing HTML file to get all H1, H2, and H3 headers. And and if you're a complete, you know, Python novice, um, well, let me take that back. You know. Most people might not even write this query. They would just, instead, they would just paste the, the link and they would say, now give me all the headers for this URL, right? But what I'm suggesting is use your, you know, use the tools that are readily available and just automate this process. So now I've got, uh, and it's certainly running pretty slow, but you can see that it's just using the Python, uh, beautiful soup library to find all the headers. And I went ahead and have done something similar to that to, bring it in here. And so now that I have my function, uh, I can start by testing the first link um, by, uh, gosh, this is my friend, but I don't know how to pronounce his name, but JC. And um, yeah, we- You do seem to be having network issues. We are having network issues. And then I can do the same thing by now, just putting that in a loop, obviously, and just loop over each one of the um, you know, each one of the links, and now I've got a data set. In this case, it's in, it's in um, you know, JSON, but I could easily convert that to whatever and load yeah. it to my database or whatever, right? And now I've got the, the foundation of my competitive analysis. First you just in time. You just in time. <laughs> so go to their site to dive into its entire Oh, community. yeah, crawl their whole site? Yeah. Yeah, of course I do. Yeah, this code doesn't do it, but yeah. That's uh, a big part of, I mean, how else do I get low hanging? Like an Autobot. <laughs> low hanging fruit. Yeah. I didn't say it was glamorous or anything, but I mean, that's, like I said, there's, so I have a client that uh, is in the travel space and, and one of their most important things is just to monitor, um, you know, uh, short-term rentals. And so they subscribe to tools that literally like every hour are pinging every single, you know, Airbnb, VRBO, collecting all that data, scraping the whole site, right? Constantly checking to see if the calendar has changed to, you know, estimate and predict if there's been a booking. Oh yeah, and people gobble, gobble up that data. And that's just one example. Obviously this is for all your competitors. So, uh, so that's, that is Python Notebooks, a, a gentle introduction. Um, any questions or? So this tool you're using was Colab, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Google Colab. Google Colab. Yeah. I mean, what are some other, like Databricks, right? Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, I mean, they're, they're still on Jupyter so more. And then of course you can run it locally with Jupyter. Yeah, Jupyter. Uh, I think is what we're still calling it. And then. Interesting one is Mage AI. There was a oh, meetup on it yeah. recently. 
but that's a fun one. What's well, Major Animators? It's uh it's like a spin-off of Super New Notebooks, but it like separates your code out into kind of like a DAG almost. Uh -huh. So each kind of code block feeds into the other code blocks and you can be like, okay, this is like the extract transfer load of this. This is the EDA here. This is the model training here. And you can kind of see it, see the path of- cool. the oh, It's like a hybrid of Airflow and notebooks. Yeah, yeah, that's probably a pretty good way of describing it. So um, great, you guys, what else? You wanna see another example or just? Network. I think we'll call the presentation done. <laughs> Thank you, Austin. Appreciate it. Appreciate everybody. Thanks.